blackout in Manhattan, and something's a little strange about that. We're going to talk about it on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hi, folks. Chuck Holton here. Thanks for watching the podcast I or listening, I guess. You might be listening on iTunes. Um, today, I want to talk about the power outage that happened in Manhattan uh, last week or over the weekend. Uh, you've probably heard about it on the news, so I'm not going to recap all of the details, but it was only one section of, uh, I think, the Lower West Side uh, in Manhattan, and it really put about 75,000 people out of power, but it did shut down some of the subway system. It disrupted a bunch of concerts. It disrupted Broadway. Uh, so it, it was, you know, pretty bad uh, for people in New York. And uh, surprising thing is there wasn't a lot of mayhem and chaos like sometimes happens. Uh, you know, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, came out and made a statement about the the ongoing investigation into what it caused it. And let's listen to that now. I just uh, flew over the city and the most of the lights are back on. That's clear. It's also clear that not all of the lights are back on. There are a lot of traffic signals that are out. Uh, still, the roads are chaotic. So uh, we would not encourage New Yorkers to go out if you don't have to go out. I applaud all New Yorkers. When things are at their worst, New Yorkers are at their best, and they were at their best tonight. Uh, as I said, job one is restore the power, get it up and running, and make sure that's 100%. You have to have a system that is designed to handle disruptions, and rather than domino, we have a redundancy in the system, so this doesn't happen. You just can't have a power outage of this magnitude in this city. It is too dangerous. The potential for public safety risk and chaos is too high. We just can't have a system that does it. It's that simple at the end of the day, and that's what we're going to work on. And I want to see, uh, with my own queen's eyes, uh, the transformer that started it all. So, you know, if 75,000 people are without power in New York City, that's like a couple square blocks, really. I mean, they just, they're so, New York City is one of those places, there are just far too many people in far too small a space. And that's part of what causes the major problems when they have a power outage like this. Uh, Con Edison is the company that manages the power grid for Manhattan. And one of their representatives came out and gave a press conference just as the lights came back on, which was good for him. But uh, listen to some of the questions or his answers to some of the questions about what caused the power outage. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John McAvoy. I'm here to represent Con Edison. Uh, we experienced a significant disturbance on the west side of Manhattan at one of our electric transmission stations at roughly 6.47 p.m. that eventually interrupted power to approximately 73,000 customers. We divide the electric system into what we call networks, which are roughly equivalent to neighborhoods. It interrupted power to six networks. We expedited the recovery, performed an initial assessment of what was the most likely cause, isolated that equipment, inspected the other equipment to identify any, any obvious um, uh, abnormalities, and now we have, re uh, we have started the restoration process. Of the six networks that we lost, we've restored two of those networks starting from just before 10 p.m. And we are working to restore the remaining four networks by midnight tonight. Now there are some unknowns in this. As we restore equipment, we, wait, we may find damage that we're not currently aware of, but we are, we are proceeding on a path to restore all customers, hopefully by midnight tonight. We'll then look at the, the root causes of the event and restore the system to a fully normal condition once we understand exactly what occurred and what caused the outages that we're all experiencing today. McAvoy, do you know exactly why this happened? It's not an especially hot day, and thankfully it's a Saturday. 
in which businesses and people aren't in their offices? Right. It, it does not appear related to excessive load as, as sometimes has occurred in the past. Okay, so we can see listening to him that he they really don't have any idea yet what exactly caused it. But here's what's strange about the power outage that happened in Manhattan this weekend. It happened on the exact same day as the massive power outage of 1977 that also happened in Manhattan. Back then, it was caused by a couple of lightning strikes that took down the almost the entire city of, of Manhattan. Millions of people without power. At that point, there were there was a ton of looting and robberies and things like that. Uh, and so, what's strange to me about this, and I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but uh, it is a little weird that this happened on the exact. Well, what are the odds that it would happen on the same day, uh, July 13th and 14th? Uh, as the big outage of 77. So, uh, you know, it could just be a coincidence, but that's an awful big coincidence right there. And because they really don't know, I mean, they, they said, well, it came down to hardware, something caught fire, something blew up, whatever. But the real question is, well, what caused it to catch fire or blow up? And that remains to be seen. I'm sure they'll do an investigation. The big question is, if they were to find that there was some kind of foul play, do you think they're going to share it with the media or with the public? Because that would just lose all sorts of speculations. One thing that we do know is that we have enemies around the world who are capable of infiltrating our power supply. And th three of those would be uh, North Korea, Iran, and China. They have the, the wherewithal and they have the inclination. And so that's something that we need to keep an eye on. A couple of years ago, I did a series of documentary, uh, investigative documentaries about the power grid of the United States, how fragile it is, and what might happen if it were to go down. Take a look. These high-powered transmission lines running across the Nevada desert carry electricity to almost four million people. It's called the Pacific DC Intertie, and it goes from Oregon, where the power is generated, all the way to Los Angeles. There are almost 150,000 miles of power lines like this across the United States. And out here in the Nevada desert, you can see how difficult it would be to secure a network this vast. There's no security whatsoever, and that could spell trouble for anybody that's reliant on this network. But the transformers on either end of the line are even more vulnerable. They are the foundation stone of our electronic civilization. Everything runs directly or indirectly on electricity. You know, none of our critical infrastructures will work. Not communications, not business, transportation, even food and water depend ultimately on electricity. And these EHV transformers is what makes the modern electric grid possible. It can't run without them. A major problem with uh, transformers is the fact of the, the cost associated with them. The larger transformers on the 500 kV can be in excess of you know, 10 to $20 million for one transformer. The ability to have a spare, it's a hard argument sometimes from an economic perspective if you have something that's going to last 50 years. In the whole entire world, the global production is less than 200 of these a year. And we have 2,000 of them in our grid. The U.S. grid was originally designed to move electricity short distances from production to consumer. But there hasn't been a new generation plant built in decades. And that means power must now travel much further than originally planned. Even worse, the average EHV transformer is over 40 years old. It's very hard to replace even one of these things. There's only two railway cars in the whole country that are specially designed to accommodate these EHV transformers. You have to reinforce bridges, reinforce the highways, because they're so heavy, you can't just move them into place. Uh, but like so many things, we don't even make them in this country anymore. And there's only two countries in the world that make them for export, South Korea and Germany. They have to be custom made. You can't mass produce them. If a terrorist attack were to somehow destroy even a small number of these transformers, the results would be catastrophic. Well, it's the greatest threat our civilization faces right now. And uh, I mean, I've studied weapons of mass destruction, all, all of various kinds of threats, chemical, biological, nuclear, physical sabotage, you know, that this country faces. And the one that's always worried me the most is electromagnetic pulse. And that's because it's the easiest to pull off. You get the biggest bang for the buck. You know, with a single nuclear weapon, you could destroy this whole country by a high altitude detonation. And at the same time, it's the least understood. Many people don't understand that it is real. 
EMP is essentially a man-made version of the solar coronal ejections that have been hitting the uh, Earth from the sun for billions of years. We get these eruptions, these coronal mass ejections, during a normal solar maximum in the peak and activity, you can see three or four a day. But it's really when you get the big ones. So it's almost like er earthquakes. So if you watch the map, you can see there are lots of little earthquakes every day, but you don't get the big ones that often. We watch for these eruptions, we model them, we say, how fast are they going? What direction are they going? Will they get here? Will they affect Earth? We have really three phases of pulse, the short, the medium, and the long. The real problem, in a way, is the third type of electromagnetic pulse, which has very long wavelength and low frequency. After a nuclear detonation, that will affect the transmission lines, and it can be carried by the transmission lines and travel very long distance, thousands of miles along the transmission lines, knocking out the transformers as it goes. Knocking out transformers is like knocking out your or my heart. The electrical grid doesn't function without the transformers that step up voltage in order for it to be transmitted long distances and then step it down again so it can be distributed in your neighborhood and to your house. You don't have to be a genius to realize that if an EMP attack were to destroy large numbers of these transformers, it could shut us down into a blackout that could last months, years, perhaps permanently. Everything is interconnected, and everything electronic depends on the grid in one way or another. It's not as if, uh, if electricity goes down, you say, darn, I've got to uh, walk up to the corner gas station with my gas can and fill up from the pump and come back and put it in the car so I can drive to work. Uh, no, I I'm afraid the electric pump uh, is indirectly at least uh, at the filling station is also on the grid and so it won't work. And I'm afraid your car has had all of its electronics uh, fused. A protracted blackout is not like an inconvenience like you have with a short-term blackout. There are vastly important and vastly dangerous industrial facilities, including nuclear reactors, you know, that depend on the power grid so that they don't blow up. Typically, they do have emergency generating power at these facilities, but usually it's like for 72 hours. Look at what happened at Fukushima, Japan, when they had a protracted blackout. You know, we've got over 100 nuclear reactors in this country, and they're co-located with our population centers. I think that people don't want to look that horror uh, in the face. And if electricity goes down, you're not back uh, in the 1980s pre-web. You're back in the 1880s pre-electric grid. And very few of us uh, have uh, enough uh, water pump uh, handles and plow horses to manage in the 19th century world. It's imaginable to have a setup for your house where you are off grid. If one was off-grid, you still would have to have your um, household electrical connections protected. But even then, a handful of people operating off-grid, and let's say live out in the mountains somewhere and no one's around, uh, you've got an off-grid house and some food and water and I don't have any and I'm absolutely desperate and I come across you, I might first ask politely and then you would have to worry that I might not be kind in trying to stay alive. Military bases and uh, police headquarters are going to be as much without light and water and food as uh, all the rest of us. Uh, we're used to having a disaster and having people show up who can deal with it, whether they're firefighters or uh, police or the National Guard or whatever, and they have trucks and they have boats and they have uh, things that can cope with it. But if nobody has any electricity, uh, they can't move. They're in as bad shape uh, as uh, the rest of us. All right, folks, that's all we have for today. I appreciate you watching the podcast. I've got a big trip coming up that later this week I'm leaving on a three-country tour. I'm going to Nigeria, South Africa, and Afghanistan. So I would appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, we're going to find some people that we can help. We're going to find some people in need, and we're going to use your donations to help those people directly. You'll get to see that on podcasts coming up. While I'm gone, I'm not sure about the situation as far as bandwidth, and so I may not be able to uh, put up podcasts every day, and so I've got some reruns planned from earlier in the show, uh, several months ago, 
things that most likely you either haven't seen or don't remember, but they're still very relevant to what's going on today. So I hope you keep watching and I hope you'll uh, go and support the podcast. Patreon.com slash hot zone is where you do that. You can uh, subscribe and uh, help support us, keep us going. And so tell your friends, share it wherever you consume it. And we'll see you back again t- tomorrow on the hot zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.